Well, good evening. I appreciate you being here. We, um, <clears throat> we do this um, on an annual basis, and I, as, as Pastor Jerry said, I think it's now been about 10 years. Um, we alternate between the Old Testament and the New Testament on an annual basis. And this year, uh, I usually teach through an entire book over the course of, of the four days, but this year, with, um, with the year of the crucified life for us, um, it just seemed like the, the Sermon on the Mount was a great fit. And so I want us to, uh, to find our way there and to spend the next, uh, today, tonight and the next three days looking at that. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is, uh, let, let me read you some quotes that I find fascinating. Uh, A.T. Robertson, a, a scholar, a Southern Baptist scholar from, from Southern Baptist Seminary, many years ago wrote, This sermon does not contain all that Jesus taught by any means, but it stands out as the greatest single sermon of all time in its penetration, pungency, and power. James Fisher, <clears throat> another scholar, said, if you were to take the sum total of all the authoritative articles ever written by the most qualified of psychologists and psychiatrists on the subject of mental hygiene, if you were to combine them and refine them and cleave out the excess verbiage, if you were to have these unadulterated bits of pure scientific knowledge concisely expressed by the most capable of living poets, you would have an awkward and incomplete summation of the Sermon on the Mount." Daniel Webster left this inscription on his tombstone. My heart has always assured and reassured me that the gospel of Jesus Christ must be a divine reality. The Sermon on the Mount cannot be a merely human production. I'm, we're going to spend the next uh, few hours together in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, as Jerry said, tomorrow we will we'll be alert to uh, letting you know if things change because of weather. I just got a notice on my phone uh, right before I stepped up here that Tulsa Public Schools has closed for tomorrow, which means probably the others will follow suit fairly shortly. But you got to remember, there used to be a time when we, when we were open or closed, depending on whatever the schools did, and somewhere along the way, they started closing for a breath of cold air. <laughs> so, so the fact that they're closed doesn't necessarily mean that we won't meet, but we will, uh, we'll keep you up to date. The Sermon on the Mount is just that. It is a sermon. We make a mistake when we break it apart into bite-sized segments. You could preach the Sermon on the Mount, and you could turn it into a sermon series that might be 20 sermons long. But what we don't realize is that while everything that's in the Sermon on the Mount is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it is, uh, it is authoritative as Scripture, we lose something if we fail to see it in its entirety as a single presentation. And so what I, what I propose to do over the next several days is I want to look at this as a sermon. Uh, you'll see on your outline, I simply said, introduction and thesis. We're going to look at his opening illustration. An opening illustration is something that a sermon uses to capture attention to sort of draw in the listener right up front so that they're interested in seeing where this goes. Jesus is going to do that. He was a master storyteller, but, but in this instance, he doesn't tell a story. He starts by saying, I'm going to tell you how to be happy. And then he proceeds to give a series of paradoxical statements that make absolutely no sense whatsoever to a normal uh, human perception of the way the world works. It would have been the kind of introduction that would have caught his listeners off guard immediately and made them say, now, wait a minute, we've never heard anything like this. And he would have captured their attention. And then he would give them his thesis for the sermon. That is the point that he's going to make. And we'll see that tonight. And then over the next three days, we'll look at the first, second, and third point. Jesus is a master communicator, and he's going to, to have a flow of thought that we can follow, 
that is very much a, a brilliant sermon that finishes with a call to decision just like every good sermon. So we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but I don't want you to, I don't want you to, to view that as just a, a throwaway title. It is actually uh, what is happening here, and I want, I, want to, I want to approach it that way over the next few days. Imagine, if you will, the context, the moment in time when Jesus gave this address. He has, we know from the chronology of the Gospels that he has just um, spent the night in prayer deciding under the leadership of the Spirit who his inner circle of disciples would be. He has just approached them. He has called them. Mark chapter 3 tells us uh, that, he, that he issued a call and, 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 and invited them to come be fishers of men. And it gives us the, the list of the 12 men that, that agreed to, to come after him and follow him. But I want you to think about those 12 men. They are, they are young, energetic men, 11 from Galilee, uh, one outsider, Judas Iscariot. But like all young men, I suspect that they longed for action. They dreamed about adventure and achievement. They wanted to accomplish something with their lives. Here they were willing to leave their homes and their businesses to become this strange thing that they had been invited to become, fishers of men. These were young men who lived under tyranny, political tyranny in the form of the Roman Empire, religious tyranny in the form of the Jewish Sanhedrin. They suffered under high taxation, extensive poverty, and frankly, they suffered from the low prospects of ever finding happiness. There were a lot of competing voices in that generation demanding their attention. The zealots were always in the shadows arguing that Armed insurrection against Rome was what was called for. Come and join us. Assassinate a Roman official. Uh, strike a blow for freedom. The Pharisees offered religious legalism. Follow the law down to the last jot and tittle. We will teach you how to be right with God. You will know how to act in every single situation. There will be no... Uh, there will be no... Uh, uncertainties left in your world, and you will make yourself worthy of the attention of God. There were the Sadducees. No, don't follow the Pharisees. They're, they're all about that legalism. They're always, they're always pushing you to, to, to work harder and to do more. Come be a Sadducee. We, we've accommodated the culture. We're progressive. We're, we're liked. We're the fun group. Come and join us. Little expectation, little demand, but, but come and, 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 and grab a place at the table where you can just enjoy yourself, and not have uh, any expectations or, 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 or requirements. Into that cacophony came one man, and the New Testament tells us that he came preaching the good news of the kingdom, Matthew chapter 4. He called them to himself, and they followed him. In the middle of a culture of crumbling standards and, 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 and economic fears, he said, there is one hope that you have, and it's the kingdom. But let me tell you about entrance to this kingdom. The entrance to the kingdom is simple. All you have to do is give up your life. But what you receive in return is, is a life beyond anything you dreamed. But once you have this life, it is a call to an entire new way of living. It is a call to, uh, to change the world. He spoke language that captured the imagination of young men who were yearning for exactly what it was he was offering. I had a pastor when I was a teenager, and I never understood really at the time, but, but he would always say, he, he had a phrase that he would always say, and, and I, it was years later when I figured out what he meant, but like when I went off to college, <clears throat> he stopped me and he said, listen, uh, I know you're going to college, 
and you're going to do fine. But I want you to go and have a good, hard time. What? I didn't understand what he was saying, but, but I figured it out years later. And, and what he was saying is the easy path never produces anything worthwhile. Go and find the hard path. Do hard things that are right. And you can change the world. That's what Jesus is, is suggesting here. The day after he calls this circle to himself, he brings them together and then he sits them down. A crowd begins to assemble around them and Jesus gives this sermon. As I mentioned this morning at the end of the second service, this is not um, uh, an ethical system for the culture at large. This is not... That people misunderstand sometimes. They think that, that Jesus is suggesting that if you just live this way, you'll be acceptable to God. But like everything else that Jesus taught, he's going to show us very close to the front of the sermon that this way that he's calling us to live, it's a paradox because it's impossible to live this way apart from his spirit in us. He's going to call us to, to live a good life hard life, but to do it in the power of the Spirit. The character traits of a disciple of Jesus Christ seem to involve qualities that are mutually exclusive. The believer is marked by certain characteristics that the world cannot possibly imitate because those marks represent a spiritual paradox. So to be an authentic disciple of Jesus is to display a paradoxical kind of life. It is there that we begin. The introduction is his new definition of blessing, and it begins with the paradox of position. Now, let me read the first two verses of chapter 5 because that sets the stage. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Remember, these are brand new disciples. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them. This is not the second mile. This is not um, Christianity 401. This is, not, uh, this is not the call to live above and beyond. This is introduction to Christianity. This is entry level. And when we read this over the next couple of days, and we go, wow, the, the expectation here is, is astronomical. I mean, he's even going to tell us at the end of the first point uh, or in the middle of the first point, he's, he's going to say, be perfect just like your Father in heaven is perfect. What? How is that even possible to contemplate? But that's the understanding. Don't let the worldly misunderstanding of this passage infect us. This is not Jesus giving us rules for a polite society. It's not Jesus saying, those of you who want to be serious about Christianity, this is where you go. He's saying, if you have my spirit in you, this is what you were meant to look like. This is the basic mode of transportation for a, for a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. So, he has brand new disciples. They sit down, and it says he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Now, Here's the introduction. This is the way he begins uh, with what we call the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude simply comes from uh, the root word that means blessed or happy. To be blessed or to be happy. He describes the ways to be happy. Now remember what I said. They lived in a generation where frankly the prospects for happiness were pretty low. They were under the heel of Rome. They were under the weight of the law. Life was hard in first century Judea. And so here is a preacher that has an unusual attraction, a draw, an appeal, a winsomeness that makes people want to know more. And he says, let me tell you about happiness. The paradox of position, verses 3 through 5. He starts by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed or literally happy uh, sets us up for the paradoxes that are about to follow. He's going to assume that we have a new heart because these keys to happiness are not natural to to mankind without, without Jesus. He starts by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to be conscious of spiritual need and personal unworth before God. That's why he starts here at the very outset of the Sermon on the Mount, because he wants us to know that if we do not have the spiritual resources in us, there's no way we can put any of the sermon's precepts into practice. This foundational understanding of who we are and who God is leads to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is simply, uh, the other gospel writers use the phrase, the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew is writing to a primarily Jewish audience, and so he substitutes the kingdom of heaven because Jews would have been offended by using the name Yahweh. That was such a sacred name that 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 name was not spoken in, in, in teaching. And so, so in, in deference to his audience, Every, every time in the, in the Gospel of Matthew where the other Gospels use the phrase kingdom of God, Matthew will substitute kingdom of heaven. But the emphasis is not on heaven. This is just his way of softening the blow uh, to, the, to their Jewish sensibilities. But he's saying this is the way into the community of faith. This is the way into the family of God. And it begins with being poor in spirit. Now, poor in spirit is is interesting. It means a recognition that without God, we can't do anything. Think back to the Old Testament, because one of the classic examples of poor in spirit, I think, uh, one, one of the interesting stories in the Old Testament is the story of Gideon in the book of Judges. Gideon finish, Gideon's story finishes um, really with some great victories. Uh, you remember the story, he started with thousands of soldiers and, and, and God winnowed his army down to about 300 and that, that's what he sent into battle because God didn't need a huge army, he needed an obedient army. We see Gideon do some extraordinary things, but being poor in spirit doesn't, isn't, isn't at the end of that story. Being a poor in spirit is the Gideon who, who, who has great victories in battle is the Gideon who at the beginning of the story says, God, if you're not going to go with me, I don't want to leave home. There's nothing I have to offer here that I can put on the table that, would, that, that, will, be, that will make it possible for me to do great things. We see the same thing happen in Exodus chapter 33 with Moses. Moses is with God, and, and, and God says, listen, I'm not going to go with you. Uh, this people, they're a bunch of stiff-necked rebels um, you take them and you lead them, and, and I'm not going to go with you because I, I might destroy the people if I go with them. And Moses, with, a, with an incredible boldness that comes out of humility, he says, he says, Lord, if you don't go with us, we can't move one step from this place. You see, it's a recognition that, that unless God is doing in us what he, what he has planned to do, we can never accomplish anything. The, the verse for, for the month, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's Christ who lives his life in me. Otherwise, I'm just going through religious motions. In a sense, it means that for a people like Evergreen, Evergreen can never be a great church until we understand that we can never be a great church. And as soon as we understand that we can never be a great church, God can make us a great church. It's a paradox. It's about being poor in spirit. And it speaks to our relationship to God. In verse 4, then, he turns to our relationship to the world around us. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. On the individual level, to mourn is a kind of personal grief over personal sin. We find this in Isaiah chapter 6 when he says, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah knew that he didn't deserve to see God seated on his throne. 
By the same token, in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? He said, I don't do the things I want to do, and I do instead the things I don't want to do. He was so aware of his own sin that it grieved him. He mourned. And yet here's the paradox. To each one who mourns in this way, Jesus says he'll receive comfort. You see, we not only mourn or grieve for our own sin, but but we weep for the sin around us. Let me ask you this question. Maybe it's related to the message that God gave us this morning. When was the last time you wept about your church or your neighborhood or your city? We've fallen into the pattern of political activism so strongly that we're always strategizing about how to fight the next fight. The church could really accomplish something incredible if we could get our minds wrapped around the fact that instead of screaming for satisfaction as our battle cry, the paradox here is that if we want comfort in our difficult day, the satisfaction is found in the weeping. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Mourning is difficult. Grieving is hard. But happiness flows from the comfort that comes from the Lord in that. F.F. F. Bruce has said there can be no comfort where there is no grief. Verse 5, blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Gentle here means freedom from pretension. It means meekness and patient endurance of injury. This is a way that we are happy in relation to other men. A gentle person is not the wallflower that we often think about when we use the word, but rather he's a person who is humble, meek, and not aggressive towards others. Gentleness is not a mark, frankly, that Christians in America have had for a very long time. We've been told to have poverty of spirit. We've been told to grieve for our sin. But here he says, have a meekness in the way that you relate to other people. Let me, let me suggest that, that the whole point of meekness is that, frankly, we should be amazed when other people think well of us. You know, we tend to be irritated when we think we don't get what we, are, what we deserve, where we, we don't get our due. We serve and nobody says thank you. We, we give and, and nobody recognizes. We, we, we do things and, and, and nobody notices. You see, if you want to be happy, you do all of those same things and then you allow yourself to be caught off guard when somebody does notice. You allow yourself to be delightfully encouraged when somebody does remember what you've done. See, we can't do what we do seeking recognition and approval, but we've been promised that there is somebody who records every work done in the name of Jesus, seen or unseen. Nothing you do goes unacknowledged or unrewarded. The problem is we want our reward right now. We want our acknowledgement right now. We want people to think we're really something. Jesus said, why don't you just be gentle? Just be meek. Serve, minister, encourage, and then allow yourself to be surprised when people think well of you. You know, I've been to funerals before for famous people. And the, the crowd is... Standing room only, wherever the funeral is, I've been to funerals that were, that were packed out because it was somebody that everybody knew. But you don't have to wait very long into a funeral before you see people doing this. I came to be seen here, but how much longer are we going to need to be here? But you know, one of the best funerals that I ever went to, I preached a funeral one time for a lady who lived in a little town in West Texas. <clears throat> there were probably 30 people at her funeral. She'd outlived most of her friends, and she, um, 
and, and she wasn't in active service in a lot of the ways that she had been over the course of her life. The crowd wasn't very big, but you know what? I could have preached for three days, and those people would have stayed there because that life that we were talking about had changed every single person in the room. Now, I don't know if we watch our own funerals from heaven. I suspect we've moved on to more important things. But I have no doubt that if she looked down from heaven and saw people giving testimony about her life at her funeral, I don't have one doubt that she would have said, oh, I just, I can't believe Martha said that. I can't believe Sally stood up and said, I, I just wish they would wrap this up. This is not about me. But see, she was gentle and she was happy because she was serving the Lord and not trying to serve herself. Well, there's a paradox here of priority. Look in verses 6 and 7. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It is not that the disciple wants to be a little bit better than he is, still less that he thinks of righteousness as some sort of optional luxury uh, that he can add to his other graces. Rather, this suggests that an authentic follower of Jesus is somebody who yearns for righteousness because he knows he can't survive without it. Righteousness, frankly, is conformity to God's will. And he says, when you're hungry to fit into God's will, to fulfill what God has for your life. When you're thirsty for that, you'll be filled. To be filled leads one to hunger more. The paradox rests in the process of desiring conformity to God's will, which leads us to actual conformity of God's will, which leads us to stronger desire to be more conformed still. My wife makes apple pie. She has just the right amount of cinnamon. I mean, it is. And she always makes an apple pie, and she goes, now just eat one piece. Okay, dear. At a time. Right? It's so good that it literally, as I get filled up, I can't wait to be hungry for it again. I can't wait for the appetite to resurface so I can do it again. That's what happiness, that's the happiness that comes from the pursuit of righteousness. To be righteous tastes so good that we can't wait for the hunger to come back around, for the thirst to emerge again. And the more we're hungry and thirsty, the more we pursue righteousness, the more Jesus makes us like him, the more we want to be uh, conformed even beyond that. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. Now, it's interesting. <clears throat> Exodus 34, 6 tells us that mercy may be God's most fundamental attribute. It, it, is literally, it literally means to help someone who is helpless. <clears throat> now, at first glance, verse 7 seems to be uh, an equal exchange. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. John Chrysostom, one of the ancient fathers, one of my favorite fathers to read, said this about this verse. He said, the reward here seems at first to be only an equal return, but indeed it is much more. For human mercy and divine mercy are not to be put on equality. This is the paradox. The one who needs mercy is seldom in a position to give mercy, but the one who offers mercy hardly ever expects to require it of himself. He's saying, blessed are those who give mercy who are in a position to show mercy to other people because their human mercy is rewarded by God giving divine mercy to us. We don't buy God's mercy. We don't earn it in some way, but we demonstrate it. And as we demonstrate the gift of mercy, we receive the mercy. And, and the paradox here is that helping other people, showing mercy to other people who are helpless in whatever that way is, it produces happiness. You say, man, ministry is so hard and 
And you know, people just are, they just require so much of my time and attention, and it's just exhausting. Yeah. Imagine Jesus, he had to die for us. And yet when we show mercy, we, we, we have happiness because we receive mercy on a much greater scale. It's a, it's a measure of our priority. That is, it's, it's the things that we set as significant enough to occupy our time and attention. Verse 6, our priority is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Verse 7, our, our priority is to show mercy to other people who need it. Then there's a paradox here of perspective. Verses 8 through 12. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in this same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now this is fascinating because, again, none of this sounds like it should produce happiness. It's a paradox. I've called it the paradox of perspective. What is perspective? Well, obviously, perspective is related to the way we see things. The term literally means to look through or to see clearly. One who views life through perspective is, is a person who, um, who, who has a, a, a way of evaluating, a lens that provides a capacity to make sense of things and put them in their true relation, their relative importance. A person who sees with perspective is a person who sees the big picture. He's able to distinguish the incidental from the essential, the temporary from the eternal, the partial from the whole, the trees from the forest. Shakespeare, speaking about an artist without perspective, said that, he, that, that, that such a man is weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. Leadership books by the dozens tell us that a leader without perspective is visionless, intimidated, vulnerable, and overly concerned with public opinion. The Christian without perspective struggles through this life between two worlds. You see, that's the essence of the discomfort many Christians have with the Christian life because of this paradox of perspective. We believe certain things about Jesus but we live by what we can see in this world. And we are perpetually confused that life doesn't seem to work out the way that we thought it would when we followed Jesus. But it's because we, we, we took the name of Jesus and we accepted the life of Jesus, but we didn't trade in the, the, the life of the way that, we live, that we've always lived. One writer has called us, uh, has called American Christians, uh, for the most part, he, he's called us Christian atheists. What he means by that is not that we don't believe about God. In fact, we tend to believe very orthodox ideas about God. But our belief doesn't translate into practical behavior when it comes to making decisions, when it comes to ha having relationships with other people, when it comes to figuring out how to live life. We make those decisions essentially as though God doesn't exist. We're practical atheists because we live, we, we make life without submitting to the Word of God, without waiting for the will of God to be played out in our life, without seeking to know what He wants us to do. We typically figure out our own course of action, we move in that direction, we hit our first speed bump, and we say, Lord, we need to ask you to bless this endeavor. You do know that God has never promised to bless your endeavors, but he has never once failed to bless his endeavors through you. It's a paradox. It's about perspective. We live with a foot in two worlds. We've got to be all in to the Jesus way of life. We've got to have this idea that, that I've burned my ships at the shore. There's no going back. Look what he says, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
Pure in heart is not here the ritual purification that was so common among the Pharisees. You remember when they came to Jesus and they were all bent out of shape because Jesus' uh, disciples, uh, they weren't washing their hands and, and, and they were walking too far on the Sabbath and, and they were eating fruit and picking it off the, off the vine on a, on a Sabbath, which they considered to be work. And, and man, they were just bent out of shape because the, 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 your, your followers, they aren't, they aren't following the rules. Jesus was like, yeah, but their hearts are pure. You know, there's a reason the Pharisees were called white sepulchers. Do you know what that is? White, uh, white tombs. In the ancient world, tombs, they would build tombs and, and, uh, and they would close them with some sort of gate or they would roll a rock, a boulder in front of it, and they, would, they, would, they were essentially caves that had been carved out and, and families would have their tomb. And what happens is they would, they would, when a family member died, they'd put the body in the tomb and then they'd close it up again. And, and particularly wealthy families, they took great pride in the family tomb. I mean, they would have work days and they would plant flowers and they would, but, but the thing that they love to do is they would take whitewash and they would paint the, the boulder and the, the front of the cave, they would paint it white. It would look clean and sharp and neat. When Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs, you know what he was saying to them? You look neat and clean on the outside, but the stink of death is on the inside. You see, the paradox of the Sermon on the Mount is that human religion tries to produce a presentable facade. Jesus, he's only interested in the heart. We're going to see that when we get to the first point tomorrow. He's not... He's not captivated by external presentation. He wants the pure in heart. Not external washings, but internal cleansiness. Not behavior only, but motive for action as well. And the result here is for those who pursue purity in heart, their reward is they will see God. Holiness is a prerequisite for entering God's presence. The pure in heart pass this test so they will experience intimate fellowship with Him. To see God, what an incentive to a holy lifestyle. You think Stephen saw the one who sits on the throne and Jesus standing at His right hand? You think Stephen saw that just because his circumstances were so bad? That God decided to throw him a bone? Stephen saw God because he knew God so well. His heart was sold out to Jesus. And in that moment, as difficult as the moment was, the reward for a life of purity was he saw God. Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now this is an interesting verse that's often misunderstood. What a contrast this verse is to those Jewish hearers who frankly were anticipating if this man was the Messiah, and it was being whispered already that he might be, their expectation was that the Messiah was going to come and issue a call to arms because they believed that the Messiah was going to show up and lead the Jews into battle against the hated Gentiles, conquer all the nations of the world, and make Israel uh, the, the crowning uh, nation of the, of the planet. All people would bow down before the Messiah and the Jews would be in charge of the world. But here he is not calling for them to assemble an army and, and, and take up their arms. He's saying, you be blessed if you're a peacemaker. Was he a fool? Didn't he understand that's not how the real world works? It's hard enough to keep the peace, much less to attempt to make peace where there's not any already. What a paradox. He says that those who will make peace... Their reward is they shall be called sons of God. Now, let me tell you about this. When, when, in, in Jewish culture, this phrase, to be called a son of God, it's not, it's not about uh, 
physical progeny. It's not about being a child of God. Uh, the phrase sons of God has about it the idea of someone who, is, who, who carries the characteristics of the father. You see, the, the title son, to be called a, a son of someone, was frankly a compliment saying, I recognize that person in this person. The idea was a son should put on display recognizable character traits of the father. Here he's saying to go about making peace is to be recognized by the world as somebody who looks and acts and talks like Jesus. Now, wait a minute, didn't Jesus talk about getting a sword and, and, and those kinds of things? Yes. And those are all in context, and we can have that conversation. But let me, let me help you understand what you need to know is the essence of his sacrifice on the cross was to secure peace between an offended God and sinful man. He was a peacemaker. How did he make peace? He sacrificed himself in order to help us do what we couldn't do for ourselves and to satisfy the justice of a perfect God he calls us now to, re to put on display the characteristics of our Father by making peace and thereby being recognized as sons of God. We're, we will be called such because we will be recognized openly as people who look like Jesus. One of my favorite things in the book of Acts is where Peter and, and John get arrested and they get dragged in front of the Sanhedrin. Here are these fishermen and they probably, they, they're probably pretty good at business, but they didn't have any actual credentials. They had never been to, you know, seminary. They didn't have any degrees in theology and, and everything. And the Sanhedrin, you know, they thought that they had solved this whole Jesus problem. I mean, they had nailed the man to the cross. There was a little bit of a kerfluffle because the body disappeared and, and they couldn't quite figure out what had happened, but, but, they, but they were ready to move on. The Jesus issue, that was, that was over, and yet the, the, the worst that possible thing that could happen, even though Jesus had died, even though his body had gone missing, you know, these followers of his, they just won't let it go. I mean, they just keep following. They keep telling stories about how he came back alive, how, how he made himself known to his people, how he gave them a charge, and, 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 and he's going to give them a helper, and they're going to be filled with the power of God to live a life that they could never live on their own. And, 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 and they said, you know, this, this is just crazy. we got to stop this. we got to nip this in the bud. And so they arrest Peter and John, and they drag them in, and they use all of the, uh, all of the, the intimidation that they have available to them to try and intimidate these basically uneducated fisher folk. The best part of that story is it says that they were stunned because when they heard Peter and John speak with boldness in front of what should have been had them cowering in fear, the authority of the Sanhedrin, when they heard them speaking with boldness, they whispered to each other, it seems like these men have been with Jesus. There was something they remembered about the boldness of Jesus, the way he spoke to them when he was walking on the earth, that they saw in these two men. They were sons of God because they were putting on display the same behaviors, the same boldness, the same confidence and power that they'd seen in Jesus, and it drove them crazy. But what a great epitaph for your, for your tombstone. Everybody that knew this person, everybody that knew this man, everybody that knew this woman, they perceived that they had been with Jesus. That's the disciple life. That's what he's talking about here. He finishes with this longer section, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in this same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, he's by human standards, he's outside his mind. You're happy when you're persecuted. 
You're happy when people insult you and say all manner of false things about you? The believers described here are those who are determined to live like Jesus lived. Here's the paradox. This person, this disciple that he's describing is to rejoice when he's treated exactly as Jesus was treated because the joy comes from the recognition of our heavenly restitution. You see what he says here? Your reward in heaven is great. Here's the thing. Because we have to have perspective, we have to live a life that says, it's okay that I'm not popular with the culture. It's okay that people don't like what I believe. It's okay that they reject the truth that I, that I would lay down my life for. Because whether I get any reward or recognition, any honor or, or, or privileges given to me in this life, it doesn't matter because just like Paul said, there is a crown of righteousness laid up waiting for me to get there. I have a reward. Now, the reward is not because I've done such a great job. It's not a reward that says, oh, you, you checked the box, you did all of these things, and so we'll tally it up, and, and here's your compensation. See, that's not a reward. That's compensation. You know what your reward is? Your reward is Jesus saying, nobody follows me and gets in the end less than they would have had on their own. In other words, whatever we give up in this life, whatever we lose because of the life of Christ that we've chosen, Jesus will not leave us shortchanged. Your reward is not payment for living this life, but it is his guarantee that by following him, you will never get less than what you would have gotten if you just lived to the fullest in the world. The world will never outbless Jesus. And so he says, when you find yourself in tough situations, when you're persecuted for me, when you uh, find people insulting you because of, uh, uh, of your faith, when they say all manner of evil against you because of me, choose to be happy because we have a reward that will come, our eternal reward not related to our piety, but it's the gift that makes up for any abuse the world gives us in this life. But here's the paradox. The more pious we are, the more abused by the world we will be, the greater is our reward. Jesus' disciples had to determine their values from the perspective of eternity. The greatest paradox of the Christian life is this. Our actions today must be determined by the promise of tomorrow. This life is conditioned by the next life. We live in an already but not yet state of being. The paradox is that no other life makes any sense except this one. Think about it this way. To live as a Christian means to live like Jesus. To live like Jesus means to die with Jesus. And to die with Jesus means to live with Jesus. It's a paradox, yet it's all very simple. Do you belong to him? And do you have a grasp of what it means to be happy in the kingdom? Now, they're hearing this for the first time. And I promise you, nobody in that crowd had ever heard anything like this before that day. They'd heard teachers talk to them about how you keep the law. They'd had teachers talk to them about how you satisfy the demands of the Old Testament sacrificial system. They, they'd been told that you had to do certain things and you had to not do certain things. And, and it was all about rules and regulations. And here's Jesus saying, you want to be happy? I'm going to tell you, happiness is, is the world as you know it set on its head because the world doesn't understand happiness. Listen, this is only more true 2,000 years later than it was when Jesus delivered that sermon because our generation thinks that happiness is no responsibility. 
Happiness means no obligation. Happiness means no restraint. I can do anything I want, anytime I want. Nobody can tell me otherwise. Happiness is unrestrained freedom. Except we live in a culture that is moving faster and faster towards completely unrestrained freedom. And every global survey says that we're close to the bottom of the most content nations on earth. Our people are miserable. Why? Because they've been lied to and they've bought the lie. Happiness is not the freedom to sin. Happiness is the freedom by the power of the Spirit in us to not sin. Happiness is to be able to walk away from the anarchy that dominates the human soul. Happiness is the ability to rest in, 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 the, in the arms of a master who has only the original best intentions for us, and we can achieve those best intentions now for the first time because we have something that we could never have on our own. We could have a different kind of life. The audience is, they're captivated at this point. They've never heard anything like this. And so he moves from the introduction and he says, he gives them the thesis. The thesis are, are in verses 13 through 16 and it says this, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house." Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. There's the thesis for the Sermon on the Mount. You have been made something that you couldn't be on your own. Salt and light, and your life is let you are left here so that your good works glorify your Father and draw people to the light that is in you. Look at the influence that he has. First of all, we have to recognize that it is impossible to follow the norms of the kingdom of God in a purely private way. All right, I run into this all the time. People say, oh, I'm a Christian. Where do you go to church? Well, I don't go to church. Then how do you know you're a Christian? Well, are you saying you can't be a Christian and not be in church? No, I'm not saying you can't be a Christian, but you can't be a good Christian. You certainly can't be a strong Christian, and you'll never be a successful Christian. Because the life of a disciple was meant to be lived in community. He gives us two pictures of how disciples are to behave, how we leave our stamp on the world as opposed to the values and the norms of the world around us. He starts by talking about our influence. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The mass of mankind needs to be penetrated and preserved. We are the light of the world. We have an expanse over which we are meant to, sh to shine. And there's no limits to the Christian's influence. Don't, don't miss this phrase. When, when, you, when you're a policeman, you only have authority within your precinct. When you're a sheriff, you only have authority within your county. When you're a politician, you only have authority within your constituency. And yet here is Jesus talking to a group of people who are by and large humble, poor, and mostly rejected by society saying, imagine that you have global impact. You're the salt of the whole world. You're the light of the whole world. We sort of laugh and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're world changers. You know, our, our, our motto here is knowing God, sharing life, changing the world. Seriously, we're going to change the world? Yes, and we're doing it. We're a part of what God is up to. And I'm tired of Christians looking around going, oh, shucks, there's nothing we can do. Are you kidding? 
The church is left here by God because we are, the implication here is that the decay of society, the the fall into darkness, it feels like it's happening at breakneck speed right now. But the the New Testament clearly gives us the implication that, that it would be unrestrained and happen overnight except for one thing. The church is salt and light. We're standing against darkness. We're preserving decay. Now, here's the hitch of that. You know, salt can only prevent decay of something by touching it. You have to take salt and you put it on meat or fish that you're trying to preserve and you rub it in. We can't be isolated. There's no monastic appeal for us to live separate from the world. We're supposed to be separate from the world in the values that we hold, but we are in the world, not of the world, but we are in the world because that's where salt has to be to fight decay. That's where light has to be to to push out darkness. We are not isolating ourselves. We are meant to be there and to have global impact. Salt preserves perishable items from decay. It is the office then of Christians to preserve the mass of humanity from utter moral corruption and ruin. He implies that the world would be ever more and more quickly rotten if it wasn't for our presence here. We don't do it through force or legislation or slick publicity campaigns. We do it by our lives. Salt preserves because that's the natural quality of salt. Light reveals the activities of darkness and guides one along a path to the proper destination. The world around us appears to be reeling into darkness. And yet, the thesis of this message is, disciples are here for the purpose of slowing the decay of our world. Why is that important? Because Peter tells us, that it is not God's will for any to perish, but for all to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, the presence of the church here battling decay and darkness is what makes it possible for heaven to be populated by ever larger numbers of people. So I don't see a lot of people getting saved in, 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 in my city. Well, actually... There are a number of people getting saved in this city. Um, But don't lose sight of the fact that the gospel is spreading like wildfire in other parts of the earth. Asia, Asia, they have set their sights on finishing the course. The, The gospel left Jerusalem and moved west until Paul had taken it all the way to Rome and maybe even to Spain. It eventually came to the new world. It, is, it then went to Japan and to Korea and, and, and East Asia. It's in China. We're told that by, the, by, by 2030, just a few years from now, the estimates are the church in China will have more Chinese Christians in that communist country than the entire population of the United States. By 2030, the estimates are there will be 350 million Christians in China. And that church has set their sights on making sure that the gospel is carried across the earth back Back to Jerusalem to complete the circumnavigation of the globe with the good news of Jesus Christ. Do not be in despair about what's happening. South America is on fire for the gospel. Europe, Europe is, is, has been dead for so long that it's fascinating to see little burst pop up of revival happening in churches across across Europe and, and, and in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has been spiritually dead for three generations, but not entirely because Jesus is doing the work there. Do not lose hope. Do not, do not, let, do not let the enemy lie to you. They always tell us that, that if we want to suppress voters... Just convince them that their vote doesn't count, doesn't matter. It won't, it won't accomplish anything. Well, the devil's been doing that with spiritual things for generations. If he can convince us that there's not really anything we can do to make a difference, then why do anything at all? But see, that's the father of lies. What does the truth teller say? The truth teller says, you're the salt of the earth the light of the whole world. So let's make a difference. 
He says that we have um, that we have a responsibility here. He says in verse 13, um, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. That is, if the salt ceases to be salty. It's fascinating because discipleship and witness are not optional elements for us. The worse the world becomes and the more its corruption spreads, the more it stands in need of true committed followers of Jesus. Tasteless salt is worthless. It's thrown into the sewers of the street in the first century because it had no purpose. An uncommitted Christian is worthless to a world that needs preservation. You and I become useless to the kingdom of God when we fail to take the issue of discipleship seriously. A lukewarm Christian has no value to either camp. He doesn't help the world and he doesn't advance the kingdom. There is no salt for salt. So how do you use your influence? Well, he tells us that we're the light of the world. Verse 14, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. A city set on a hill, anything that gives light will be observed, much like a city in the ancient world that was set up on a hill. It could be seen distinctly on all sides and from a distance. D.A. Carson uh, I, I read a quote one time. He does some hiking in Canada, and he, he wrote this in one of his commentaries. He said, in Canada, it is possible to go camping hundreds of miles away from any city or town. If it is a cloudy night and there is no phosphorus in the area, the blackness is total. A hand held three inches from your face cannot be seen. But if there is a city nearby, perhaps even a hundred miles away, the darkness is relieved. The light from the city is reflected off the clouds and the night, once perfectly black, is no longer quite so desolate. Likewise, Christians who let their light shine before men cannot be hidden and the good light they shed around attenuates the blackness which would otherwise be absolute. You don't have to be the light, you just have to be a light. Say, well, Pastor, I wish I could be a spotlight, but I'm... I'm more like a candle. You ever had a blackout? You go get those candles out of that drawer, you know, that that junk drawer in the kitchen where you keep stuff, and you light those candles. You realize it doesn't take but one or two candles, and you can make your way all the way through your house, every room. Say, I'm not a spotlight. I I don't have a big platform. The, The world doesn't really know me. Okay, but go be a candle for Jesus. Let your light attenuate the darkness. We must be in a prominent position. You are the best Christian somebody knows. Ponder that for a minute and realize that there's no escape from that reality. He says, here's an absurd picture of somebody who hides a lamp. He he lights it, but then he puts it under a basket so that nobody can see it. That's absurd because a lamp has a natural use. By our nature as Christians, we have a natural duty to live like Christ in a world that needs to see Him. That's why our life is on purpose. The, The thesis here, verse 16, your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The shining of the light is neither personal confrontation nor church pronouncement. Rather, it is the light of Christ seen in a lifestyle of good deeds. It's, he, he started with homely, everyday pictures in this sermon. He said, I want you to see, I want you to think about salt and light. But he's going to take us all the way to the point here of now glorifying our Father who's in heaven. I've got a couple of of quotes from the church fathers that I want to then I want to leave with you. Clement of Alexandria said this speaking about Matthias the uh, the apostle that was elected to replace Judas Iscariot the the 12th apostle in the in the Jerusalem church. Clement of Alexandria who was much closer to the original generation certainly than we are. He said, Matthias the apostle used to say that if a pious man's neighbor sins, he himself has sinned. For if he had ordered his life properly, the neighbor would have been restrained by his example. In other words, are you out with your neighbors, 
with the people at your workplace? Do people engage with you because you are there putting Christ on display? Or are you living under a basket, just sort of keeping your faith to yourself, going about your business, trying not to ruffle feathers? Let me tell you something. He's going to tell us right up front in these early verses that He's about to take us on a journey that is going to put us on display for the world around us to see. But it's not us that they're going to see. It's Him through us that will be on display. There was a commentator from the ancient church that said this, of all the modes of teaching Christianity, living it is the best. The best commentary on the Bible the world has ever seen is a holy life. The most eloquent sermon in behalf of the gospel that the world has ever heard is a uniform act of piety. The best version of the written truth that has ever been made is a consistent religious example. And so as we prepare to get into the body of the message, we have to face these questions. How do you use your influence as a Christian? Are you saltless, that is, worthless to the kingdom of God? Or do the people of Tulsa know that you're a Christian because they see you live like one? Does your lifestyle, your language, and your priorities, do they point men to Christ? Are you salt and light in this community? Because remember where he started. You say, that's just such an odd way to live life. Yeah, but, but don't you remember the beginning? True happiness comes from the paradox of not living the life that the world offers us. You tired of having one foot in two different worlds? Jump in. Say, oh, the water's deep. Yes, it is. But the lifeguard is the best in the business. You are the salt of the whole earth. You are the light of the whole world. Let us go and put Jesus on display. Father, thank You for Your Word. Even here, not even barely past the, the opening introduction, what we find is that You have presented us with something extraordinary. You have painted a picture of what it is You're calling us to become. And Father, I pray that over the next days as we hear Your sermon, as we watch You unfold the, uh, the plans that You have for us, Father, find here a people whose hearts are hungry to be what You want us to be and who are willing to lay down any obstacle so that we can live the paradox of the Christian life that You've invited us to. Father, make us to be recognized as the sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.